Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Vantage Seminar. And we're going to continue our series on Galois representations and modular curves. Uh, this, this series is in memory of Boss Edixhoven. And today we're very happy to have Fred Diamond as our speaker. And he'll be speaking about geometric Sarah weight conjectures and theta operators. And feel free to interrupt the top with questions at any time. Uh, so Fred, is it all right if we video this talk? Yes, sure. And I, um, I would also, I'll also try and keep an eye on the chat uh, if people want to use that. OK, wonderful. Please go ahead. Um, so thanks very much for the, for the invitation to speak and, and the uh, introduction. Um, it, it's an honor, of course, to, to speak in a seminar series devoted to, to Boss's memory. Um, I only crossed paths with him a few times, but uh, he always made a great impression. And of course, so did, so did his work. Um, and I'm going to talk about a strand of, of research that's largely inspired uh, by his work on the weight part of CRS conjecture. Um, so Hanukkah discussed, uh, discussed this last week already. Um, but just to remind you that, uh, so after a few other people proved some critical cases of the conjecture, Boss in this, in this beautiful Invenciones paper uh, pulls everything together and completes the proof of, of the weight part of Serres conjecture. But not only does he prove the original version of the weight part of Serres conjecture, he formulates and proves a, a variant that involves modular forms of weight one. And um, there's, there's an important difference um, involved here. And, and for one thing, you have to be careful about what you meant, what you mean by a modular form of weight one. And in particular, you need to take a much more geometric perspective. Um, and so I'll uh, remind you of this. And, and then I will describe an analog in the context of Hilbert modular forms, again, related to what Hanukkah discussed last week. But again, from a much more geometric perspective, and the motivation, the reason for doing this is that this geometric version, inspired by Boss's variant of Serres conjecture, reveals a lot of interesting aspects that are missing from not just the original um, version of Serres conjecture, but a lot of generalizations that involve what I refer to as algebraic Serres weights, or algebraic Serres weight conjectures. Um, so the, the plan for the talk um, is, first of all, to remind you of the statement of Sarah aspects of the statement of Sarah's conjecture and eight of seven's variant. And then I will say a little bit about the algebraic generalizations, well, the algebraic formulation of the weight part of Sarah's conjecture and its generalizations. So this um, overlaps a lot with Hanukkah's talk. I guess it was two weeks ago. Um, and then I'll move on to the Hilbert modular setting, again, overlapping with Hanukkah's talk. But now taking a much more geometric perspective for, um, uh, in discussing mod P Hilbert modular forms, um, I'll discuss associated Galois representations and then how the geometric perspective um, uh, motivates some uh, uh, weight shifting or leads to um, certain weight shifting results, namely involving partial Haas invariants and partial theta operators. And then I'll explain the formulation of the geometric Serre weight conjecture in the context of Hilbert modular forms um, and make some remarks about it and describe some results towards it. Okay, so first of all, the statement of Serres conjecture. As you, you know, if rho is a continuous, odd, irreducible mod p representation of, so this g sub q is my notation for the absolute Galois group of q, or g sub k for the absolute Galois group of field k. Um, Serres conjecture says that any such mod p, two-dimensional mod p representation is modular in the sense that it comes from a modular form. And more precisely, it comes from a modular form of some prescribed weight, k rho and level n rho. And 
the, uh, the, this level, n rho, is prime to p. It's the prime to p Artin conductor of rho, so it depends on the ramification away from p. And the k rho, the weight, so both of these are supposed to be in some sense optimal. This optimal weight k rho is given by an explicit recipe in terms of the uh, restriction to a Galois group, um, restriction to a decomposition group at P. So it depends essentially on the ramification at P. And an important aspect from my point of view of the original version of uh, 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 Sarah's conjecture is that the weight there is assumed to be at least two. And as you know, this is a theorem due to Karyo Venterbege, building on uh, work of lots of other people, notably Serre, I'm sure leaving out people, Serre, Mazur, Ribbit, Karyo, Coleman and Volokh, Gross. Um, so Serre, Mazur, and Ribbit, well, especially Mazur and Ribbit, um, proved important results towards, and Karyo proved important results towards nailing down the correct level. And then Coleman, Volokh, and Gross proved companion forms results um, that feed into the proof of the weight part of the conjecture. Um, and then finally, to prove the modularity, um, building on uh, Wiles' method for proving, Wiles and Taylor Wiles' method for proving modularity in Kissin, um, as well as the results on the refined version of Sarah's conjecture. So using also the results that pin down the weight and the level, Carrier Ventimbergé, by this ingenious inductive argument, um, proved the modularity part of Sarah's conjecture so that you end up with the full conjecture. Okay, so um, as I mentioned before, an uh, important Um, an important point in treating, in considering Edixhoven's uh, variant that includes weight one is to be careful about the definition. What exactly do you mean by being modular of weight one, arising from a modular form of weight one? Um, and for this, you need to take this geometric perspective in thinking about modular form. So remember, the modular curve, y1 of n, open up by y1 of n, the open modular curve, the quotient of the upper half plane by gamma 1 of n. And it's a, it's a moduli space. It parameterizes pairs. Its points correspond to isomorphism classes of pairs, e comma p, where e is an elliptic curve, and p is a point of order n. So for its, its complex points are in bijection with the set of isomorphism classes of such pairs. And you can extend this notion to describe the compactification as well, x1 of n using this notion of generalized elliptic curves, which is really important for, for our purposes today, but um, just to make everything um, correct. Uh, so I'll, I'll take uh, the, the generalized, so there's a universal object for this moduli space. You have a universal generalized elliptic curve over the modular curve x1 of n. And if you take its, uh, its cotangent bundle along, pulled back along the, the zero section, so the cotangent space along zero for this universal uh, elliptic curve, you get a line bundle, usually denoted little omega, and the a geometric way of thinking about modular forms of weight k and level n is that these are global sections of this line bundle raised to the kth power. So my exponents here will almost always be um, uh, tensor power. So this is the kth tensor power of the line bundle omega. It's global sections. Uh, this should be x1 of n. Its global sections are precisely the modular forms of weight k and level n, meaning with respect to the, the congruence of group gamma 1 of n.
and uh, it has a natural action of heck operators, um, out the usual heck operator T sub V for all primes V. For our purposes, we can just take V not dividing N. And then SV, I'll, um, I'll use to denote the, the double coset operator with Vs on the diagonal. So this is the, the usual uh, diamond operator times V to the K minus two, be another way to define this. And also to make everything correct, I'm going to fix embeddings of the algebraic closure of Q into complex numbers and into an algebraic closure of QP. Okay, so now to modular forms, you can associate Galois representations by a theorem of Akhtar, Shimura, Deline, and Deline and Serre. Um, so if you have a, a Hecke eigenform in the sense that it's an eigenform for all the operators TV and SV, say for V not dividing uh, N, then there's an associated Galois, uh, there's an associated Galois representation, a two-dimensional p-adic Galois representation. Um, convenient just to work with coefficients in the algebraic closure, QP bar. So for weight two, this was constructed by Akhwin Shimura and then Deline for higher weight, and then Deline and Serre for weight one. And it has these properties which characterize that it's unramified at all the good primes, those not dividing P or the, or the level. And it's a characteristic polynomial, the characteristic polynomial of Frobenius at such primes is given in terms of the, in terms of the Hecke eigenvalues by this equation, by this polynomial, the Hecke polynomial. And then of course, for Serre's conjecture, we're interested in mod P Galois representation. So you can reduce these Galois representations modulo P, you can always choose a basis. Um, so that the image of this compact group G sub Q uh, is contained in GL2 of the ring of integers. If you like, you can replace this QP bar with the ring of integers of a finite extension of QP. Um, but again, just for convenience, GL2 of ZP bar. Uh, so the, the image of the absolute Galois group is contained in GL2 of ZP bar with respect to some basis. And then you can define the, um, the mod P Galois representation associated to F as the, the composite. So this is well-defined um, at least up to semi-simplification because this reduction could depend on the choice of basis. But in particular, if the reduction is irreducible, if rho F bar is irreducible, then it's independent of the choice of basis. So you get this well-defined representation rho F bar. And if the, of course we say it's modular, of weight K and level N if it arises in this way. Um, now in, in the version of Serre's conjecture, in Eidichshofen's variant of Serre's conjecture, um, this turns out not to be the right definition. We need a notion which I'll refer to as geometric modularity and the, this, um, this moduli problem that defines the modular curve x1 of n actually makes sense over uh, z with n inverted, z adjoin one over n, or over zp if you like, as p doesn't divide n. It's representable by a smooth scheme, a smooth curve, and you can talk about the reduction of the curve modulo p. So, uh, and I'll just go to the algebraic closure, which will suffice for our purposes. So for P not dividing N, we can take the reduction of X modulo P. So we get a smooth curve over, over FP bar. And I'll again use omega, this should be omega bar, is the, is the corresponding line bundle in characteristic P. You still have a universal elliptic curve in characteristic P. And you can define this line bundle over the curve in characteristic P, and then define the space of mod P modular forms to be the sections of this line bundle. And again, you have heck operators, associated Galois representations, and now I'll just use rho sub f for 
the GAWA representation associated to a mod P hacker eigenform F. And this notion of, uh, so I'll, I'll say that rho is geometrically modular of weight K in level N if it arises in this way. If it's associated to a, a mod P hacker eigenform where we define the space of mod P modular forms in this geometric way. But if K is at least two, then the notions are equivalent. There's actually no difference between the two definitions, geometrically modular or modular of weight K, because um, you can see uh, by Riemann Rock that this uh, that every section in um, characteristic P lifts to characteristic zero. So combined with little commuter algebra argument, you see that any eigenform in characteristic P lifts to a characteristic zero eigenform. So you don't get any more Galois representations this way if the weight is at least two, but it does make a difference uh, for weight one. And then another important um, thing you see from this geometric perspective is, is the Hasse invariant in characteristic P. It's a mod P modular form of weight P minus one, which you can define. So remember, these are just sections of omega to the P minus one. A section of omega to the P minus one, we can think of as a, as a, as a homomorphism from omega to omega to the P. And there's a, uh, there's a natural such homomorphism, the one induced by Rashidong. So you get this modular form in characters P of weight P minus one that vanishes exactly at the super singular points. So in particular, it's, it's non-zero and multiplication by the Hasse invariant defines an injective map from the space of modular forms of weight K, the space of modular forms of weight K plus P minus one. So you shift the weight by P minus one. And it follows that if rho is geometrically modular of weight K, then it's geometrically modular of weight K plus P minus one. So it's also true if you remove the geometrically here. And the, um, another uh, type of weight shifting is given by the theta operator defined by cat. So this is a, this is a differential operator, um, which shifts the weight by P plus one and its effect on, I'll, I'll come back and say more about its construction later in a more general context, its construction and properties. And its effect on Q expansions um, can be thought of as QDDQ. And examining its compatibility with heck operators, you see its effect on, on eigenforms, the way in which it affects the eigenvalues of, a, of, a, of an eigenform is to multiply the eigenvalue of, of PV by V. And as a consequence, the, um, it'll send eigenforms to eigenforms, but the associated Galois representation gets twisted by the cyclotomic character. So a consequence of this is that if rho is geometrically modular of weight K, then it's twist by the cyclotomic character is geometrically modular of weight K plus P plus one. Um, I'll come back to this later. And in fact, I'll tell you why this is the wrong way to think about it, but I'll, I'll explain that later. Um, so Adix Hovind's um, variant of Sarah's conjecture defines instead of, so I, I use K sub rho, I think this is consistent with the notation in Hanukkah's talk last week, two weeks ago. So uh, K rho is, was the, and, and in Adix Hovind's paper as well, K rho is the um, original Sarah weight which I think Hanukkah reminded you of the definition of as well. And K of rho is the same as K sub rho. So Adix Hovind's weight is the same as Sarah's weight, unless the representation is unramified at P, in which case you, you redefine this optimal weight to be one. 
because that's a situation in which you can hope to get an, uh, an associated modular or a Ga the Galois representation arising from a modular form of weight one. And then what Boss proves is that at least if P is not equal to two, I think this is known now for P equal to as well, but if P is odd, then if rho is geometrically modular of some weight K and level N, then it's geometrically modular of this, um, of this optimal weight K of rho and level N. So again, using this notion of modularity defined in terms of mod P modular forms viewed as sections of the line bundle omega to the K in characteristic P. And furthermore, this weight is, is, uh, is minimal, it's optimal, it's the smallest weight. And you can describe all other weights for which rho is geometrically modular um, as just being, as just differing from uh, this optimal weight K of rho by a multiple of P minus one. And again, the original K rho was determined by the restriction of rho to a decomposition group at P. And this condition determining whether K of rho is one is also, you see, determined by local behavior at P. And as I said, it describes all the weights for which rho is geometrically modular by this condition here. And now that we know Sarah's conjecture um, holds for K of rho combined with this, we also know that it holds, um, sorry, knowing the original version of Sarah's conjecture um, with this weight K sub rho, the version, latex Herbin's version follows as well. Okay, so now, um, one way to think of um, Sarah's conjecture is as part of a mod P Langlands philosophy or mod P Langlands program. And the, the level part has to do with local global compatibility away from P. It's relating the behavior of the uh, Galois representation away from P at primes um, different from P to the uh, local behavior in some sense of the modular formula corresponding automorphic representation, local factors of the automorphic representation away from P. The weight, since it's related to the behavior at P of the Galois representation, should be thought of as some kind of local global compatibility at P if there were a mod P Langlands program. And this is one reason to think about it in the, in the context of, of more general automorphic forms, for example, Hilbert, Hilbert modular forms. And there has been lots of work generalizing it. Uh, so for example, for GLN due to Ashen collaborators and then with, with but so in Jarvis, we formulated a version for Hilbert modular forms. So for the group, the reductive group, um, restriction of scalars of GL2 from a totally real field, um, <clears throat> generalized by Shine and, and G. Um, re, it's, it's not really for this group, but for, for units in quaternion algebras over the totally real field, certain quaternion algebras. Um, and, uh, various other generalizations due to Herzig and Herzig and Tilleween, and then quite a general version due to G Herzig and Savit for connected to reductive groups, which are unramified at P. But as I alluded to before, these are all algebraic Sarawit conjectures. They're all based on an algebraic reinterpretation of the weight part of Sarah's conjecture. Um, which, uh, which Hanukkah discussed in her talk. 
Um, and let me say uh, a little bit about where, where this comes from and where the, uh, where the deficiency is in these versions of the weight part of Zeus conjecture. So where does this reformulation or reinterpretation of the weight part of Sarah's conjecture come from in the context of classical modular forms, what we can do is form this locally constant sheaf over the modular curve, the usual modular curve over the complex numbers associated to this representation of gamma one of n, the k minus second symmetric power, for which of course we have to assume the k is at least two. So gamma one of n projecting to SL two of fp acts on this uh, acts on this vector space. You can form this locally constant sheaf and take its cohomology. Here, working over the uh, open modular curve by one of n, this comes with an action of Heck operators, and you can also even more algebraically think of this as just the group cohomology the cohomology of gamma one of n with coefficients in this, in, this, in this module, in this representation. And using the Eichler-Shimura relation, it's not hard to see the row is modular of weight k in level n, if and only if, the, I mean the Eichler-Shimura isomorphism, um, which relates the space of modular forms of weight k to this, to, these, uh, these cohomology groups. Um, it's not hard to see that rho is modular of weight k and level n, and here it doesn't matter whether I say geometrically modular or not, if and only if the corresponding Heck eigen system arises in this, in this space. And instead of working with this representation uh, k minus second symmetric power, you can instead just focus on, as Hanukkah did, the Jordan Holder factors. And so just look at irreducible representations of we really want to think to get the full heck action. To get the full heck action, you really want to think about um, representations of GL2 of FP. And that it, and then rho is, I'll define rho to be algebraically modular of weight V, where V is an irreducible representation of GL2 of FP if the corresponding Heck eigen system arises in, the in, this, uh, in this cohomology group. Okay, any questions? No, it sounds great, thank you. Ah, and the, so one reason for doing this or this to complete the connection is that the, if you know the set of such V, the set of V for which rho is algebraically modular, then that determines the set of weights for which rho is modular. So you can think of the weight part of Serre's conjecture, or if you like so this refinement of the weight part of Serre's conjecture, from this algebraic perspective as giving a recipe for this set of representations or Serre weights. So the set of V, the set of irreducible representations V of GL2 of FP, such that rho is algebraically modular of weight V. So two problems with this. One is it completely ignores k equal one, completely ignores weight one. And it also ob obscures the fact that there's a, there's a minimal such weight k, but Hanukkah explained how, how to recover that in her talk. And then for Hilbert modular forms, so now in the case of um, restriction of scalars of GL2, where f is totally real, you ignore even, even more weights, in particular partial weight one. 
And minimality is even more obscure. The fact that there should be, and uh, as we'll see later, there, there is a notion of a minimal weight. Um, it becomes even more, more obscure from this point of view. Um, and again, this is related to what, what Hanukkah talked about. So what I'm gonna focus on now is how to uh, recover this information, how to include the possibility of partial weight one modular forms um, and also see that there's supposed to be a minimal, a minimal or some kind of optimal weight. In other words, how do we generalize Adixhoven's variant of the weight part of sales conjecture? And of course, the way to do this is to, to take a geometric perspective. So now let me set things up in the context of in the context of Hilbert modular forms. So F will be a totally real field of degree D. I'll assume that F is not equal to Q. And at least initially, I'm going to assume that P is unramified in F. I'll even assume P is inert in F just for notational simplicity. Um, everything I say up until the end of the talk easily generalizes to, um, uh, to the case of P unramified. And the level now will be an open compact subgroup of the finite Adels. Um, I'll assume it's of level prime to P, meaning that it contains the, a maximal compact subgroup at P. And I'll assume it's sufficiently small, for example, e, uh, contained in or even equal to, if you like, for the purposes of the talk, assume that it's U1 of N. So the local factors at primes dividing, um, so it's contained in GL2 of OF hat, and the local factors at primes dividing some sufficiently small ideal N um, satisfy a star star zero one. They look like star star zero one modulo modulo N. And I will work over the ring of integers of a, a sufficiently large extension of QP. I'll write sigma for the set of embeddings of F in Q bar or equivalently C or equivalently, since I'm assuming K is sufficiently large, embeddings of F into K by my identifications of Q bar into C and QP bar. Well, I guess in this case, QP bar. Um, and uh, since I assume that P is unramified, I can also identify the, the, the embeddings of F with embeddings of the residue field. And in fact, since I assumed that P was inert, I can just uh, list these in order. Um, I'll just arbitrarily choose some tau zero and label the others by composing with the Frobenius automorphism. So phi will be my notation for the Frobenius automorphism. Composing with powers of Frobenius, you get all the, all the embeddings. So, and there are D of them, starting with tau zero. And it's usually convenient to view that the index high, uh, the index I here as being uh, an integer mod. Okay, so then uh, we can define the, the Hilbert modular variety as a, again, a modulized space parameterizing abelian varieties now with some additional structure. So now the abelian varieties will be of dimension D where remember D is just the degree of the totally real field. Um, but now with an action of the ring of integers, OF, um, and this technical condition, we require that the, that the, um, that the cotangent space be locally free over OS tensor OF. And uh, we also want a level U structure. For example, if U is U1 of N, then this is just an embedding of a constant group scheme OF mod N. 
into, into A. And then this defines a smooth steam of dimension D. This is, so there's a, there's a fine moduli space. So if you include polarizations as well, but I'm taking the quotient. And you get a smooth steam over, uh, over O, in fact, over ZP. Um, because I assumed that, uh, that, that N was prime, this N here, or the level is prime to P. And its points um, have this usual description as a, as a Shimura variety, as this Hilbert modular variety. So um, D powers of the, uh, D, D copies of the upper half plane um, times GL2 of the finite Adels mod U and take the quotient by the totally positive elements of GL2F. And you can also describe it more classically as quotients of, um, of H to the D by congruent subgroups that depend on your level U. Um, but then we can also define a, uh, a line bundle, an automorphic bundle, an automorphic line bundle on this uh, moduli scheme on the fine moduli scheme, and then we we'll want to take the quotient and descend to YU. Um, so this condition on the on the cotangent bundle means that it decomposes um, as a sum of D line bundles uh, according to the embeddings of F into um, into K. So these will be the, uh, the line bundles of omega to the i, so we'll take its powers. So now the, the, the weight is being indexed by a pair of D, D tuples, the important one being k for now. Um, but there's also another, another natural uh, line bundle here that you can define by taking the um, by taking the determinant of the Durham, the relative Durham cohomology, uh, which again decomposes. So you got these other line bundles, uh, delta sub i, um, which is, uh, so it, it's convenient to carry for various reasons. It's convenient to carry around these other line bundles in this context. Um, in particular, this, this line bundle AKM descends to Y if, um, if KI plus two MI is independent of I. So in particular, the KIs all have the same parity or the K is pericious. Sorry about that. But more generally, um, working over any base, what you see, the condition that you really need is, is this one right here, that the product of the, um, uh, these embeddings applied to units in the open compact. So this, this product, the value of this character here is trivial in R. So in particular, if you work in characteristic P, then this will always be satisfied if you take a sufficiently small open compact. So you can work with arbitrary weights. The parity condition goes away in characteristic P. And so you can define modular forms of arbitrary weight in characteristic P. There's no more parity condition. The modular forms of weight, K and, uh, of weight Km and level U over FP bar will just be the sections of this, of this line bundle. And also we don't, because of the Coker principle, we don't need to worry about compactifications. We can just take sections over the open Hilbert modular variety. 
And again, there's an action tech operators. And there are associated Galois representations. So if you have a Hecke eigenform, then there's an associated Galois representation characterized in the usual way. It's unramified outside, uh, outside the level and P. And the characteristic polynomial is of Frobenius is given by the same formula, where now we have the norm of V. Um, so the idea for proving this, so this is joint with Sasaki, the idea for proving this is, um, so when I first started thinking about this geometric version of Sears conjecture, it was a little disturbing to realize that, that one didn't have the Galois representations uh, associated to eigenforms in this generality. So you have to do a little work to, to get that. The idea is to multiply by partial Hasse invariants, which I'll talk about soon, and then, and, and, and then lift to characteristic zero. So multiply in order to get a sufficiently nice, get to a sufficiently nice and large weight where you know that you can lift to characteristic zero, where you know that the, the, the line bundle that you're talking about is ample and that will allow you to lift to characteristic zero. Um, and then once you're in characteristic zero, you have associated Galois representations, thanks to work of Cario and Taylor in, first. in this context, it's a result of Taylor. Um, so this was in fact done, but under parity hypotheses, uh, independently by Goldring and Koskoverta and Emerton, Rudinsky and Chow, um, but uh, to, to remove this uh, ex extra parity condition, you, you can no longer lift in level prime to P, so you have to be more careful. You have to allow P in the level when you produce a lift to characteristic zero in order to construct the associated Galois representation. And then I'll define a row, a Galois representation to be geometrically modular of this weight, and if you like level U, if it arises in this way. Okay, so I mentioned partial Hasse invariants. They're constructed similarly to the, the classical case. So this is due to Andreata and Gorin, uh, or maybe in this case, Gorin. Um, so again, you have the morphism that's induced by the Beershebung on the universal abelian variety in characteristic P. And it defines, um, now it, it shifts the component. So you get a, a, a morphism from omega i to omega i minus one to the P. And so if thinking of that as a section of now this automorphic bundle, omega i inverse omega i minus one to the P, this descends to the Hilbert modular variety and so defines a, uh, a modular form of a weight I'll call H sub i. And notice that you have a P followed by a minus one if we order them in this way. So this is one way to shift weights of Hilbert modular forms, geometrically defined Hilbert modular forms. And multiplication now by the Hasse invariant gives you a, this uh, Hecke equivariant, it's not hard to show that this is Hecke equivariant, and so it sends eigenforms to eigenforms. So if rho is geometrically modular of some weight k comma m, it's also geometrically modular of this shifted weight, shifted by this, the weight of this partial house invariant. So I, um, now you can define a minimal weight essentially by dividing by these partial Hasse invariants as much as possible. So we define the minimal weight to be the weight if you can't divide by partial Hasse invariants. Um, so yeah, it's what I said. You, you divide by partial Hasse invariants as much as you can. And what you get is, is the minimal weight. That's one way to think about it. Um, so you need a little, you need to know a little bit, you need some input for this to know that you can't keep dividing arbitrarily, you need to know that the vanishing locus of these partial Hasse invariants meets every component of the Hilbert modular variety, and also that there are no common components, so there's no sort of ambiguity about which partial Hasse invariant you're dividing by. 
Um, you can do something similar with these other line bundles, the delta i's, these uh, delta for determinant bundles, um, but these turn out to be isomorphisms. So in particular, the, um, these delta i's are, are torsion bundles. And they have, they're just twisting. Um, and so they also have no interesting global sections, but they're important to keep track of, uh, for example, hedge action. Okay, so uh, uh, jointly with, with Kasai, what one can show, what we showed was that the, this minimal weight um, actually lies in a uh, minimal cone. So it, I guess if, if you assume, so the positivity here um, is, is with an additional assumption on, on F, which I won't, uh, won't discuss. And one way to think of what this is saying is that the, the weight, so if you, uh, dividing by partial Hasse invariance as much as possible, the weight of your modular form lies in this blue cone, the minimal cone. And so the, the, the weights that you get by multiplying F by partial Hasse invariance lie in this red cone here, which is just the, the Hasse cone, the cone, so this is of course in degree two, this picture. Um, the, uh, the, the weights of the multiples of F by products of powers of Hasse invariance all lie in this, in this red cone with the minimal point always being in the, what I call the minimal cone. Okay, so you, you also have a weight shifting um, that generalizes uh, the Katz's theta operator. But now the shift instead of p comma minus one is by p comma one, and it shifts the uh, the m as well by a minus one. So the one and minus one here are in the ith component for the ith partial fate operator. And another important fact is that that uh, the image of f under the partial fate operator is divisible by a partial Hass invariant if and only if f is or if the weight component is divisible by P. So this generalizes a result in the, in the classical case. Um, maybe for lack of time, I won't say much about the construction, except to emphasize that, uh, so there are different incarnations of this construction, but the common feature is that you, you differentiate and apply the Kodaira Spencer isomorphism. So the Kodaira Spencer isomorphism is going to shift the weight, or at least the k part of the weight by two. Um, and, but you also need to multiply by the partial Hasse invariant. So that's why um, you're getting a shift by, by p uh, in the component preceding i and one in the i component. And you can determine the effect of theta on Q expansions and describe its kernel. Um, and also it has this nice periodicity relation. So you can define theta cycles again to be the minimal weight of this uh, series, the sequence of um, sequence of modular forms that you get by applying the, the partial theta operators. And remember in the classical setting, uh, if rho is modular of weight K, then it's twist by the cyclotomic character is modular of weight uh, K plus P plus one. But from this point of view, you see that this, this is not the natural way to think about it. This is not what's going on. Um, these state operators are HECA equivariant. They're not going to change the, uh, the HECA eigenvalues. You'll get the same Galois representation. It's really the automorphic bundle that's changing. Um, the, this, 
this doesn't generalize nicely. This twisting doesn't really generalize to this to this context. Um, there's no uh, you, what you'd want here, at least locally at P, would be a, a fundamental character, and there's no global extension of the fundamental character. It's really the automorphic bundle that changes. Um, so from this point of view, what you see is that if rho is geometrically modular of some weight, k comma m, then it's geometrically modular of weight k prime comma m prime, where now we've changed the m as well. Okay, so now let me state the geometric zero weight conjecture. If you start with a, a continuous irreducible two-dimensional mod p Galois representation, so totally odd just means the image of complex conjugation of every complex conjugation is, is, uh, has determinant minus one. Then there's some minimal weight, which is in the minimal cone and um, determines all the weights from which rho can arise just by shifting by um, non-negative uh, linear combinations of weights of partial Hasse invariants. And this minimal weight, and in fact, all the weights in the minimal cone are characterized in terms of Piatikaj theory, in terms of the existence of a crystalline lift. Okay, so now let me uh, make some remarks about the conjecture. First of all, it, this generalizes Adix Sorbin's variant. Um, it gives you the set of all possible weights being described by some minimal weight, and that minimal weight is described in terms of Piatikaj theory. Um, and it allows for the possibility of partial weight one now. Um, so maybe I should back up to the statement. So for there to exist a, a a k min of rho as in one looks like it should follow just from looking at the minimal weights of, of modular forms, but in fact, it's not immediate uh, because rho can arise from forms with different Q expansions. So you have to be careful. You have to analyze the, the, the different ways in which rho can arise from a modular form, specifically the, the, the somehow P part of its Q expansion. Um, so in the statement of the second part, uh, the uh, characterization of the minimal weight in terms of Piatikaj theory, this really only works for weights in the minimal cone. Um, and it's related to conjectures in, uh, in modular representation theory as Hanukkah described in her talk related by the brown Weiss conjecture to conjectures in, in modular representation theory. It leads to formulations of conjectures in modular representation theory for, for, um, for GL2 of a uh, finite field. Um, the dependence of the minimal weight on this M, so as you, as you apply theta, you're changing M, this minimal weight depends on M, and what you get is essentially a theta cycle. So that motivates studying theta cycles. Um, and as I said, now you, this involves, so the, the minimal weight can have components that are ones. They're all equal to a one if and only if the representation is unramified, at least conjecturally. But partial weight one is more subtle. It, it's not, to, it, it, um, it's not described in terms of rho being unramified. There's a sense in which rho is less ramified if it arises from partial weight one, less ramified in the sense of vanishing of images of, of higher ramification groups. Um, but just to state, yeah, so I'm pretty much out of time, but just to state some, some evidence involving partial weight one. So again, jointly with Sasaki, um, we prove that if the representation has a crystalline lift, um, uh, whose labeled Hodge-Tate weights suggest that 
the minimal weight should be partial weight one, or imply that the minimal weight would have to be partial weight one, that in fact it does arise from a, it rises geometrically from a modular form of partial weight one. So the indexing here, the one K is for the K, uh, um, uh, the K parameter in the weight and the zero, zero here is the M parameter just for simplicity. You can, um, modify that as well. Um, and we prove this using results on the algebraic um, uh, version of stair weight conjectures in this context of BDJ conjecture. So results of G and collaborators um, to show that the um, the representation arises from modular forms of, of these, two, um, these two weights, which are algebraic in the sense that the, the components are at least two. And you can even rig it so that these forms have the same Q expansions. And comparing the weights, you see what happens. So this one here, P plus one comma K minus one, is the shift by the weight of a Haas invariant from one comma K. So you wanna prove that it's divisible by, you wanna prove that this F is divisible by a Haas invariant, but by Andre Atagoran, it's enough to prove that when you apply theta, what you get is divisible by a Haas invariant, but comparing theta F and G, you see they have the same Q expansions, the, the weights of, uh, um, but, the weight of theta of F is the weight of G plus the weight of a Haas invariant. So you deduce this, you have your divisibility of F by a Haas invariant, and so you end up with a partial weight one modular form giving rise to your representation row. Um, okay, so uh, just a few words about the ramified case. Uh, everything generalizes to the ramified case. Um, the case where P is ramified in the totally real field. For example, if P is totally ramified, um, it's given, um, the, the changes are listed here, but the important change, the thing to notice is that where you had P's before in weights, for example, of Haas invariants or in the shift by partial theta operators, where you have P's, now you have ones instead and also in the de definition of the minimal code. Okay, so I better stop here. Um.